A lot of them totally won't know me yet. They just know, know of him as here and Anderson. Probably a lot of them haven't met him. Be quite a few that haven't. Most of the younger ones, I suppose. What about the older folks in Elgo? I, I don't think they'll ever have met him. They wouldn't have did. I don't suppose they would be interested in <laughs> La been? Landlord would be a landlord to them, but it's just, uh, no matter who it was, it was just a whole one to them. But it's pointless getting really self-conscious about this thing about being the laird and the, and the crofters being your tenants who pay your rent and all that. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's no big deal. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's no big deal to them either. I mean, it really isn't. We tripled, we tripled the rents uh, a few years ago. For the first time, the rents went up from, you know, an average of about four pounds a year per croft. We put them up to an average of about £12 per year per croft because we decided that rather than not collect the rents that we would make available from the estate every year uh, a sum of money equal to the rents that we collected to be used on something for the good of crofting. And somebody else might say, well, you could afford to give them 20000 a year or build a new village hall or whatever else. They, they wouldn't respect me for that. from the bustle of touring with a rock band, Ian Anderson lives a life of sharp contrast among some of the most spectacular scenery that Scotland can provide. It's clear that his experience of running one successful venture has helped another take off. There are a few ripples on the water, however. In an area where jobs are scarce enough, there's some concern that the fish farm, which could have been a considerable source of employment for local people, has not turned into the jobs bonanza that it might have been. Well, it's tremendously difficult for the islanders here to, to make what I think should be the, the full potential because it's, it's a capital-intensive industry. So if the grant structure and the loan structure is not geared to the, the local economy, then inevitably what is going to happen is that, that money is going to control the industry, and that means outside money. And that, by and large, what is what has happened. It's interesting to see the contrast between Sky, where fish farming is almost exclusively in, in the hands of outside capital, and the Western Isles, where there was a, a development program which allowed for a much higher grant level and there you had many local people coming into the industry as the developers rather than simply as the the waged employees right Rob, we've got a couple of uh... robert kelly was one time road manager with jethro tull he's since come to work on the island as fish farm manager together he and ian anderson take policy and staff decisions i could have a word with the see what she's looking for and see if she's suitable. That's right. I mean, again, it depends. I mean, presumably she's looking for something full-time. You can explain to her sort of what the, the potential might be. Mm -hmm. This, this one is, is uh, he's 34, is he, from Achna Clerk? Yeah, he's got a degree in agriculture. That's right. And he's got nothing, no background at all in fish farming, but I spoke to him on the phone yesterday. As he puts it, he's only 100 yards up the road. He's actually the fourth house down in the Crofting Township, so he's probably only a couple of hundred yards actually away from the site. The sites themselves have become a bone of contention with the Crown Estate Commissioners, the body which owns the seabed and which is responsible for where and if fish farming sites can be located. It seems to me incredible uh, that in 1986, um, in this country, that the, the, the myth exists that the seabed belongs to the Crown uh, and that therefore the control of, um, the, of, of an industry as important as this resides with 
totally faceless people, uh, various lords and earls called the Crown Estate Commissioners, and it was in their hands to dispense the rights to the seabed. And in these early days, the deals were done between the multinationals and the Crown Estate Commissioners without the local communities having any idea of what was going on. And then, too late in the day, they realised that people living beside lochs which had this tremendous value potential for uh, fish farming realised that the leases had been bought up and something was going on uh, be below their, their noses. Um, so once again, it's not it's, if you live in remote communities in Scotland, uh, you're not the ones who know what is going on in the Crown Estate Commissioner's office in Charlotte Square. You're not the ones who know what deals have been cooked in the boardroom of Unilever. What you know is when something starts happening on the ground and you realise that another uh, potential development asset has been conceded. The risks are, are fairly high. I mean, I think you've got to accept that one way or another, you, you probably budget for something like uh, between 15 and 20 percent mortality per annum on your sea stock for one reason or another. Now, logically speaking, there's no reason why you should lose more than three or four percent of them at sea, but something happens every year. There is always something that comes and knocks you sideways. But uh, again, it's, it's reducing that level of risk to an acceptable ongoing level that is part of staying in the business. Sales of smoked salmon are on the increase, with the Scottish variety leading the market. The North Atlantic salmon is a regal fish bred for size and quality. After a year spent in growing tanks, they're transferred to the sea cages. Here, fed on a diet of concentrated food pellets, they will spend the next two years growing to a killing weight of five or six kilos. In order to have the ideal genetic pool for the future, we have during this last year taken a lot of purebred wild fish from the uh, two of Scotland's good rivers, the Spey and the Conan. And I personally like the idea that we try and retain some of that mystique of the, the wild Scottish North Atlantic salmon, um, that we, we always have that animal in its pure, unadulterated form available to back cross with our selected best multi-generation farmed. Uh, stock. It probably isn't necessary, but I think it's nonetheless prudent to have that availability. Difficulty in obtaining top quality eggs has led to the establishment of their own brood stock. Now the fish are regularly graded for their breeding potential. This development will help to ensure a strong, disease-free strain, and with the addition of the occasional stock from the wild, the cycle from egg to fully grown fish will be complete. The mature females are taken for examination. Here the eggs are counted and checked for quality before being transferred to the hatcheries. They're quite good, mate, are they? They're not bad, actually. Yeah, here's a female. They're fairly developed, aren't they? They've still got... Yeah, it looks to be in good condition to me. Yeah, it's all a good colour. Yeah. Right, well, I'm hoping to hear something from the HIDB next week about whether they're going to approve this emergency grant for our uh, extra dam buttressing work. So, hopefully we'll be in a position to decide fairly soon what the time's going to be The hatchery has benefited from having a stream that guarantees a supply of clean water all year round. Stored in a dam near the site, this ensures that the fry get a healthy start in life. It's part of the plan to safeguard the future of the farm. 
Ian Anderson has taken the central role from helping design the tanks in the hatchery to picking the sites for more sea cages at the northerly store locks or the newly completed growing tanks at Skibost. These new developments have been undertaken with a view to increasing yearly production to 200 tonnes. At Skibost, the finishing touches are being made to the tanks that will house the smolts before they're moved to the sea cages. Wherever possible, these new sites have been kept out of the way in an attempt to preserve the natural beauty of the surroundings. charitable you might be about salmon pens, cages and the water, they are a bit of an eyesore. Being rather geometrical shapes in the water, they don't look that pretty. So I mean that's the way they affect most people in the in the most direct way, it's just the fact that it's a, a visual sort of impinging on a view that they've taken for granted for years and years and years. But personally speaking, I don't find them that much of an eyesore in relation to perhaps the option of seeing, uh, you know, red and yellow sailed pleasure boats or, or whatever occupying the same bit of water, or perhaps people fishing in the conventional sense, prawn creels or whatever else. The fact of life is people out there on the water earning their living day to day. When the fish have reached full size, they're killed and frozen for the journey to Ian Anderson's smoking and packing plant at Inverness. We have considered processing salmon on Sky, but I think given the expansion that we're undertaking in salmon farming, we need something a bit more central and something a bit better able to deal with the, the tonnage throughput that we would have. Uh, two or three years down the line. But we chose to have a, an all Scottish sort of setup. So Inverness was the choice back in 1982, and I think it was the right choice. If it wasn't Inverness, it could only have been in London. Smoked salmon is a very, very competitive business. We can't supply a single hotel or a single little restaurant or delicatessen in London the way the London smokers can, so we tend to deal more in bulk. So we supply people like Harrods and Selfridges, and probably we will continue to base most of our sales on the export trade. That's really the biggest growth there, particularly in the US, where they don't really know yet what smoked salmon is. we actually do have the right environment for, for, for growing North Atlantic salmon. And we can actually grow better than it seems anybody else in the world can do it. So Scottish salmon really is a very exciting thing to be involved in. The ones who are good at it will continue to do okay. And the ones who aren't will fall by the wayside. Falling by the wayside is not a fate likely to threaten Ian Anderson. As founder of a successful musical enterprise, he's put his business experience to good use on Sky. His deep involvement here should guarantee the survival of his Hebridean venture.